God is at work through Hope Church. He always has been. When we were six people meeting in an upstairs office room, God was at work. Now that we've grown to 10 locations across 10 different communities, God is still at work because He is our foremost affection. His truth is our greatest pursuit. And Hope Church is an amazing family of incredible people. People who will welcome you the first time you come through the doors as though they've known you for years. People who provide a safe and exciting environment for your children and students to flourish as they learn to know and love Jesus. People who love to spend time together, laughing, encouraging, and supporting one another. People who passionately follow Jesus and serve in a way that makes Him visible in their community. People who worship God together with passion and love to hear God's Word preached without apology. People who love beyond their limits. People who give beyond their means. People who serve beyond the walls of our church building. People who promote the identity of Jesus Christ beyond their own identity. We are Hope Church. Well, we're going to be continuing in our series we have been in over the last few weeks called We Are Hope Church as we talk about the biblical, uh, the DNA of a biblical church and what that looks like. And, and we've been walking through the last few weeks like our DNA at Hope Church, what we believe, what makes us who we are as a church. And we not only believe that this is the DNA of Hope Church, but we believe most importantly that this is the DNA of any biblical church church. And so we're going to be walking through this for a few more weeks, talking about that and and what that looks like. And so today we're going to be uh, jumping back in. I know last week, uh, David Velasquez was here from Hope Church Danville and uh, I got to watch online and I wished I could have been here with you guys, but David did a phenomenal job walking you guys through Daniel chapter number three, talking about what it looks like to thrive in Babylon. Uh, And so we're going to jump back in this week into our series Uh, We are Hope Church. And so we're going to look today at what it means to be the church. And one of the elements of our DNA at Hope Church, and I believe that not only just Hope Church, but the DNA of a biblical church is this, that we are not called to go to church, but rather to be the church. And, and, And the reason why we believe that so strongly is because church is not something that we can go to. Church is who we are. We are gathered here today as the church to worship, but we are not here at church because when we are together, we are always the church. And we're going to talk about that today, what that looks like to to be the church. And so for the last several weeks, we've we've been in the series uh, talking about We Are Hope Church and what is DNA of a biblical church. Well, first, let's answer the question, what exactly is DNA when we say that? What do we mean by that? Well, the scientific term, and I hope I pronounce this right, is deoxyribonucleic acid. Uh, And it's a molecule that contains the biological instructions that make you and me unique. Each one of us have DNA. In fact, most of us have probably seen what a DNA strand looks like. And all of us are comprised of DNA. It's, who, it's what makes us who we are. It's, it's what forms our physical characteristics. It's also what makes us who we are as individuals as far as just the way we're wired. Our DNA has all that. Did you know that you're in your DNA, now that they can look and see whether you're going to be predisposed to certain conditions in life, They can look at your DNA and say, hey, it's more likely that you're going to probably be diabetic in your life, or it's more than likely that you're going to face this physical uh, issue, or that you're going to deal with this. Our DNA is so complex. It's one of the most complex things that has ever been created. And so DNA, along with the instructions that is contained within it, is passed from adult organisms to their offspring during reproduction. So whether you're a human, whether it's a, it, it, it's a cat, it's a dog, whatever, every single created being has DNA that they pass on to their offspring. And so just like as we have children and they take on our characteristics, 
We are, if we are in Christ, we are the children of God. And so we have DNA that is within us. And what I mean by DNA, the characteristics that should reflect who we belong to, that we belong to Jesus, that we belong to him. And so our DNA is what makes us who we are as humans, but it's also what makes us who we are as a church and as followers of Jesus. Uh, and, and so what, what do we mean by that? Well, most churches, if you look at them from, from the outside, let's just be honest, as we drive down the road, don't most churches, if you just look at the outside of the building, most all churches look kind of the same. If, they're, if it's a church that's been around for a while, it's probably going to have certain characteristics. Most all older buildings have steeples. So if you see a steeple, you can pretty much say, hey, that, that's probably a church building. Most all of them have uh, some sort of, uh, older buildings have some sort of stained glass, window, stained glass windows in them that you see. And from the outside, a lot of these buildings look the same. <clears throat> Let's say, for instance, if you're driving somewhere and maybe your particular favorite fast food restaurant, they're, they're designed in a certain way. You go inside certain stores, whether it be Walmart or Target or, or any of these places, and they're all like kind of laid out for the most part the same way. They look the same. They want you to, to, to be able to, to go in them and know that you are at a Walmart, you're at a Target, hey, you're at Chick-fil-A, you're at Cookout, wherever it may be. So most churches from the outside look a lot alike. But here's a question. Who are we as a church and what do we stand for? Those are the things that, that need to define us. Who we are as a church and what do we stand for? So we don't want to be defined by just what our, necessarily our property looks like on the outside. We don't want to be defined by, you know, uh, making sure that we look like a church building on the outside or making sure that, that people know uh, necessarily by looking at the outside who we are or what we stand for. We want to be known for who we are as a church and what we stand for by, by what we live for and what we're about. And, and we want our DNA to show forth. Our uniqueness is, is what makes us who we are. And that's one of the things I love about being a part of Hope Church that is it's unique in, in, in a way that I've never experienced. We were talking about this this past weekend at, at the Leadership Summit was that I've never experienced a brotherhood like I have personally experienced with all of the other 11 Hope Church pastors. I've never been a part of something like that. I've never been a part of a, of a church family that is like Hope Church. And, and, and I'll just be straight with you. Like, I think, honestly, everybody should be a part of Hope Church. And if I didn't, I wouldn't be a part of it because I think there's something that God is at work doing. And it's not that Hope Church is special, but it's that what God is doing in Hope Church. And so <clears throat> our unique, uniqueness is what makes us who we are. And as individuals, our uniqueness is, is what makes us who we are. We're all unique. And, and there's not another single person that God has created that is just like you, that's just like me. Uh, and, and so we're all unique. And, and so we go through a lot of this stuff when we go through our membership class that we call the family room. We, we talk about what sets us apart as a church and what we believe is important about the DNA of Hope Church, but most importantly, the DNA of what we call a biblical church. But how many of us remember this saying as a kid? Maybe, maybe you, you heard this. Maybe your parents used to teach you this. I, there's a hand motion for it, but I don't think I can even do it anymore. But how many of us remember this little saying, here's the church, there's the steeple, open the doors, and there's the people, or see all the people. <clears throat> Maybe that's how you had it. I, 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 there used to be a way to do that. I know I'd butcher that. But how many of we all remember that. Like, we, we would say that to our kids. It was something maybe we heard our grandparents do. On the surface, maybe we, we don't give this a lot of thought when we, we say that. But even this simple thing that we do for children reinforces this idea that our culture has that somehow the church is the building. And the church is not the building. The church is a living, breathing organism. It's alive. The church is, is not a place we go. It's not a building, but it's a people that have been called out. In fact, that word church in the Greek, it's ekklesia, which means called out. We have been called out and called to something. And so according to scripture, the church is not a building, but rather it is a people. 
So let's jump into a couple different verse, uh, passages we're going to look at today that's going to be our text that we're going to deal with. And the first passage is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. And, and, and I have this from the New Living Translation. And here's what God's word says. It says, don't you realize that all of you together are the temple of God and that the spirit of God lives in you? God will destroy anyone who destroys this temple. For God's temple is holy and you are that temple. Notice what Paul's saying. He says, don't you realize, he says that you, all of you together are the temple of God. And he says, and the spirit of God lives within you. Now, this is a big deal because in Jewish culture, they had a temple. They had initially Solomon's temple that was rebuilt. Then you had Zerubbabel's temple that was, uh, uh, that was rebuilt after Solomon's temple was destroyed by the Babylonians. And then after that, you had Herod's temple, which was, which was a massive structure. And, and so the Jews had this temple where the, the, was the Holy of Holies. And, and within the Holy of Holies, it contained the, the Ark of, of God, the Ark of the Covenant. And it had within that Ark, they had the tablets with the law written on it. It had the, the pot of manna. It had Aaron's rod that had budded. And so this was where literally, they called it the Shekinah glory of God. And it was literally where the presence of God dwelt with his people. And so only the high priest on one day a year, on Yom Kippur, the day of atonement, could the high priest enter the Holy of Holies. If anybody else entered, they would be killed immediately. And if the high priest entered on any other day, he would be struck dead. And so they could only go into this place one day a year. And so the high priest had to go on behalf of the people and enter into the presence of God. And so God's presence dwelt within that temple. And so the Jewish people, they, they were raised and they, their, their religion and their tradition was that God's presence dwelt in this place. And this was a big deal because we know that when Jesus was crucified on the cross, when Jesus finally gave up the ghost and he surrendered and laid down his life, what happened? It says that the veil, there was a veil that separated the holy of holies from the rest of, of the, the, the temple area. And what happened? That veil that was there to separate, to keep people out except for the high priest, it was torn. And it didn't just tear from in, in any way. It tore in a spectacular fashion from top to bottom. And that's a big deal because that curtain could not be torn by human hands. God himself ripped that veil apart. And so now, because that veil was torn and the veil comes down, now there is access to God anytime for anyone. That now we have access. And so we don't have to go get a high priest to go into the Holy of Holies for us one day a year to atone for our sins, we can enter the Holy of Holies at any moment, at any place, and we can commune with the Father. We can have fellowship with the Father. We can pray and intercede for ourselves and for other people. And Paul says, do you not realize that all of you together, he says, you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God lives in you. And so he says that God will destroy anyone who destroys this temple for God's temple is holy. And he says, you are that temple. So here's what that means for us today as the church. It means that God's presence does not dwell within buildings. God's presence is here this morning. Why? Because we brought him in with us when we came in this building. And guess what? When we leave, he goes with us wherever we are. So here's what that means for us. It means that you and I didn't have to come to this building this morning to have an experience or an encounter with God. We can have that anywhere at any moment. And, and we don't have to, to even come down to, to what this place is. From, we call it an altar in, in, in church world. But really, to be honest, it's just a place that we've set apart for, for prayer. It's a place we've set apart for people to, to, to worship and for people to commune with God. But God doesn't just dwell here. It says God dwells here. We are the temple. And that's why it's such a big deal that we understand that the church is not a building. There's nothing holy about this building at all except for the Holy Spirit that lives within us that came in with us today. 
And so it's really important that we understand that. But let's look at the next passage in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 20 through 21. Paul writing to the church at Ephesus. He says this, he says, Together we are his house, built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. And the cornerstone is Christ Jesus himself. We are carefully joined together in him, becoming a holy temple for the Lord. Notice, we're, we're, we're the church. The building's not the church. We're the temple. But Jesus is the cornerstone. Jesus is the head of the church. And, and Jack did a great job, I know, talking to you guys the, the week we were in Israel, several weeks back, when you talked about the preeminence of Jesus and how Jesus is always the center focus of everything. And that's one of the things that, that at Hope Church we believe is not only our DNA, but biblical DNA of a biblical church is that Jesus is always the center focus of the church. It's always all about Jesus. Always. And if it ever ceases to be about Jesus, then we need to cease to exist. Because if it's not about Jesus, then we're just another social club. And so Jesus is the head. Jesus is the only celebrity in the church. Jesus is the senior pastor of the church. But together, he says, we are his house. We are built on the foundation that is Jesus. This is not the house of God. We are the temple and the house of God because God dwells within us. And so I love what pastor and author David Platt says about the church. He says, the church is a community of people that know Jesus intimately. The church is a community of people that know Jesus intimately, not know about Jesus, but that know Jesus. And so as we said already, part of our DNA is Hope Church and part of uh, a biblical church DNA is that we are not called to go to church, but rather to be the church. So let's talk about that in the time that we, we have together today. What does it mean to, to be the church? What do we mean by that? Well, public worship should not be seen as going to church. So often in our culture, we say that, hey, I'm going to go to church this morning, and, and I do this too. We all, we say it. We have this lingo. Let's just be real. We, we really can't escape it. I even told people, it's like, hey, I got to get ready to go to church this morning. I got to go to the church. I, but I'm not going to the church. I'm going to the church property or, where, or you could say where the church gathers. I, I, I have to catch myself all the time. I say that, and, 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 and I'm really bad when talking to other Christians. I'll say, hey, yeah, I'm, I'll, be at, yeah I'll be at the church. Well, if I'm with God's people, I'm always at the church. But it's the gathering of the church. So what does that mean? It means that no matter where we gather, we're always the church. And so if we couldn't gather in this building today, if somehow, some way we had to, to go outside and we had to start meeting outside because we didn't have a building or, or, or something, we're not any less the church meeting outside in the parking lot or under a tree or meeting in, in a coffee shop or, or, or meeting in a park. It doesn't matter. We are not any less the church when we are there than if we're here. But what that does is it presents you and I with the opportunity to impact our community as we, by living as the church. When we see church as who we are and not something that we go to or something we do, it presents an opportunity for you and me as the church to impact our community by living as the church. How do, how, how do we be the church? Well, we be the church, we're being the church when we're, we're living out the commands of Jesus. We're being the church when we're making Jesus visible. We're being the church when we are being the hands and the feet of Jesus, when we're loving as Jesus is loved, and when we're serving as Jesus is served, and we're proclaiming truth as Jesus has proclaimed truth. We are being the church. Jesus declares believers that we are the temple. And that means that he doesn't live in buildings, but his spirit lives in those who are saved. If you have repented of your sins, if you have come to Jesus through faith and you have placed your faith and trust in Jesus, then God's spirit dwells in you and his presence dwells in you and his presence dwells in his people and not in a building. 
So let's, let's talk about this, some practical things. What, is, what do we mean being the church? How, how are we called to be the church? What does that look like? Well, here's the first thing in your, in your worship guide if you're taking notes. Number one, being the church means having a right understanding of who Jesus is. Being the church means having a right understanding of who Jesus is. Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 through 17. I'm gonna read this, these verses and then I wanna elaborate a little bit on this in just a moment. It says this, when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the son of man is? Well, they replied, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, and others say Jeremiah or one of the other prophets. Then he asked them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Jesus replied, you are blessed, Simon, son of John, because my father in heaven has revealed this to you. He says, you did not learn this from any human being. Now, let me talk about this for a moment. Now, we've all read this passage so much when, when we're talking about Jesus is talking to his disciples and he's like, hey, who do people say I am? And, oh, some people think this, Jesus. Some people say you're John the Baptist. Some say you're Elijah. You're one of the other prophets. And, and they're saying, well, there's a lot of different opinions, Jesus, on who you are. Well, but who do you say that I am? And then Peter, of course, speaks up and he's like, hey, you are the Christ. You are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And he says, you're blessed because he said, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father in heaven has revealed this. But I didn't understand the significance of this passage until we were in Israel a few weeks ago. And I'm going to tell you, I think I, John and I were talking about this a few weeks ago. And, and, and man, I, I'm going to be honest, I didn't know the depth behind what Jesus was saying. Our tour guide was, was talking to us and, and telling us about, we went to Caesarea Philippi where Jesus stood and said these very words. And, and right behind Jesus was a pagan temple, the temple of, uh, of Pan. And it was a pagan temple. You know what happened at that temple? They sacrificed children to their pagan God. You know what the Jews called that place? He said, they called that place the gates of hell. And so Jesus is telling them when, he's, when, they, when he, he talks about building his, his church and he says, I, he, and he goes later on to talk about upon this rock, the confession of faith that Peter just made, not Peter, but the statement that Peter made. He says, and upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. You know what he was saying? This place right here, the gates of hell where the most demonic and satanic and pagan activity happens, he says, this is not going to overcome my church. All this evil happening right here where I'm standing, he says, it doesn't stand a chance. It's not going to overcome my church. And so we've got to have a right understanding of who Jesus is. Who is Jesus to you and to me? Because what we believe about Jesus makes all the difference in the world. And what we believe about Jesus makes us who we are as a church. So today I ask the question, who is Jesus to you? Is Jesus the Christ, the son of the living God? Is Jesus who he said he was? Is Jesus a prophet? Is he just a good teacher? Is he somebody who had some great ideas? Is he maybe someone who you look at who is a, who is a radical that just bucked the status quo and, 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 and thumbed his nose at authority? Was Jesus a fraud? Was he a fake? Was he a liar, a phony? Who is Jesus to us? And how we answer that question is really important because if we're going to be the church, we've got to have the right mindset and understanding of who Jesus is. So who do you say he is? Another question, how much do we really live for Jesus? How much are we living for him? How much of our life is consumed by Jesus? Let's just be honest, guys. If we're being real today, I'd be the first one to tell you my life is not consumed by Jesus like it should be. If I'm being real with you, there are a lot of things that consume my life often instead of Jesus. I get consumed by my own preoccupation uh, with worry about the future and, and worries about things I really don't need to be thinking about. I get consumed with just living life. How many of you really like just, I mean, let's just be real. We just get, we get caught up in living life. I mean, we just do. 
And we're not consumed by pursuing Jesus and, and pursuing that relationship. And as John and I were talking about before the service, allowing his spirit to just shed light in our hearts about things. And, and that was one of the things that, man, really hit me when we were in the Garden of Gethsemane. And we were there, and that was honestly my favorite place because it was one of the place, few places we got a few moments to just stop and be. I mean, they ran us to death. Like, we walked four to six miles every day, and we were going. I, we walked 40 miles that week. Can you believe that? And, and I thought when I came home, I was like, man, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm doing good. I'm going to keep this up, get home, get COVID, and get stuck in the house. And that got shot to pot, so it was like, you know, no more walking for me, I guess. But, uh, but you know, we were in the garden, and... And we got some time and, and we got to just sit there. And they said, you know, we had someone who shared a devotion and they're like, we're just going to give you guys some time to walk around the garden, to read, to pray, to meditate, to do whatever you guys want to do. And I, I, so I went and grabbed my Bible and sat down on a bench and, and uh, just started reading through the accounts in the different gospels of Jesus in the garden when he's praying and he asked the disciples to pray. And reading John 17 as he's praying that priestly prayer for all of us. Man, I'm going to tell you, just sitting there. There was something powerful about that, just to, to be. And you know what? I, I realized that we've really lost the ability to just sit and to just be consumed and to take in who God is and just let him just speak to us. But... How much of our life is consumed by fill in the blank compared to Jesus? How much of our life is consumed by time we spend on social media compared to, to Jesus? How much of our life is consumed by watching politics and the news compared to being consumed by Jesus? How much of our time is spent watching TV and, and watching movies and pursuing all these other things besides being consumed by Jesus. Here's the thing. Jesus should be our whole life. It should be who we are, meaning our whole life should be about Jesus. The pursuit of our entire life as a child of God should be to be more like Jesus. Now, I don't, we're not going to, we're going to fail and we're not going to hit the mark. In fact, most times we're not going to even come close to probably hitting the mark, but it means our life is consumed by trying to follow Jesus as best we can every day. Number two, being the church means having a right understanding of who we are. I love that we opened with that song, Who You Say I Am. I love that because it's important for us to have a right understanding of who we are. And it means that we need to be willing to live for a cause greater than ourselves. It's one of the things I love about being part of Hope Church and, and, and being part of what I believe is a biblical church is that we're called to live for something greater than us. Being a part, being a part of, of Hope Church is, is bigger than just being part of Hope Church Martinsville. There's a greater family that we're a part of. Some of you have got to experience that larger family. I want more of you to get to experience that because there's something special about that. Because we're part of a larger family, but even greater than that, we belong to a larger family yet called the church, made up of all born-again believers. And we're part of Jesus' body together. And it's something great and something big, and it's bigger than us. Paul says in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, he says, My old self has been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. So I live in this earthly body by trusting in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Meaning that he says, my old self has been, been crucified with Christ. The life I live now, it's about Jesus. It's not about me. Saying, I, I've been crucified, I've been put to death. All my ambitions, all my desires, all my pursuits. He says, I, I put them to death. And they're about, and now my life is about pursuing Jesus. And it's about making Jesus the center of everything. So we are to die to ourselves by putting aside our, our self-indulgences, our desires, our ambitions, our thoughts, our dreams. 
It, it doesn't mean that, that, that we can't never do anything for ourselves. It's, it's not saying that. It doesn't mean that, well, hey, you know, we just have to suck it up and be miserable. No, it, it means that, that we seek God and God's will for our lives above all else. So here's the thing. When I was in high school, I had no idea what I wanted to do with my life. Uh, I graduated. I went to community college, started in business, thought I'd do that. Didn't really have a clue. One of the friends I worked with, she's like, I, 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 I'm going to go. She was starting community college later the next year. And she's like, I'm going to study, be a paralegal. And yeah, yeah, that sounds great. Let's do that. Yeah, why not? Paralegal, great. Uh, you know, and then that didn't really pan out. Then I thought, well, I really don't know what I want to do. So I just kind of worked some places. Well, then it was like, well, I think I'm going to go back to school. Hey, you know, occupational therapy is a great field. What's an occupational therapy? I have no idea. Hey, it sounds great. Let's do that. And, and so then I went back to work for a little while longer. And, but I always had this love for computers. I was like, I want to do something with that. So I went back to school, got a degree in IT, and started building computers, doing upgrades, repairs, software installs, things like that. And, man, I loved that. That was awesome. Man, that was like, it was like great. I mean, I didn't feel like I was working a day in my life. It was like I loved what I did. Well, God had other plans for my life. And, well, through circumstances, the business I'm working for, the owner passes away, the son comes in to take over the business. The son's a great tech. He has no idea how to run a business. So guess what happens? No paycheck anymore. <laughs> Well, thankfully, he was kind enough to say he laid me off so I could at least draw on employment, which was really, I appreciated that. But so I'm doing that. And I'm like, okay, God, what are you doing here? But I, I knew God was pulling me into ministry. I knew God had called me to preach earlier the year before. I knew I was supposed to be doing something in ministry. Well, guess what? God found a way to push me out of where I was and push me like, okay, here you go. And, and God led us into missions. And we began to raise our support to go to the country of Paraguay in South America. And we spent years doing that. And then we moved to Paraguay. And, and then when that season ended and we came home, I knew God was moving me into to pastoring. And, and God opened that door. Well, I say all that to say this, that, that if you'd asked me 20 years ago, no, I don't want to pastor a church. Are you crazy? Like, I want to do that. That's insane. I can't get up and talk and talk in front of a group of people every week. No. Man, the first sermon I preached, like, you remember the big old pulpits we used to have and stuff? It's like doing this, gripping onto that thing. Like, that was my security blanket. And, you know, you could hide behind it and stand behind it. Like, there's no way I'd have been walking around and talking and stuff like that. It's like, no, I'm not going to get up and talk in front of people. But God had other plans. And so I say all that to say this, that you need to die to your self-indulgences. I need to die to my self-indulgences. Our desires, our ambitions, our thoughts, and our dreams. And crucify them and say, Jesus... Whatever you want from me, God, whatever your will is for my life and, and however you want me to serve you, that's what I want to do. Being the church means that we got to have a right understanding of who we are, that we are crucified with Jesus, that it's not about us. It's living for something greater than ourselves. Number three, I got to hurry. Being the church means we live with gospel intentionality. Being the church means we live with gospel intentionality. See, we're either spreading the gospel or we're a hindrance to someone else finding it. We're either spreading the gospel or we're a hindrance to someone else finding life change in the gospel. And, and, and so we're either sharing the gospel or we're not. That's the bottom line. Like either we're sharing the gospel and we're proclaiming the gospel. And what I mean by that is I don't mean necessarily like, and some of you who've been in church for years, you know exactly what I'm talking about because you might have participated in this. I'm not talking about knocking on a complete stranger's door or walking up to the stranger in the coffee shop and going, handing them a track and going, sir, if you die today, would you go to heaven or hell? And then you just, bam, gospel. You know, I'm not saying that sometimes that, like there have been people that have come to faith that way, but I've found that in the past when we were doing that, that the people that came to faith that way, God had already been dealing with their hearts. And when I came, I was just watering the seed that had already been sown. And so when I say gospel intentionality, it means that we're having gospel conversations daily. We're building relationships with people. Because here's the thing. If I walk up to a complete stranger, I can say something, and they're like, who the heck does that guy think he is telling me that? I'll never forget years ago. I know this has happened. Some of you may even have remembered this. 
You know, back in the day in the, you know, like 50s and 60s, you know, there were TV preachers and it was sinful to own a TV. You know, some of y'all remember that. Some of, you know, like, I mean, I, I didn't re- never grow up that way, but, you know, it was sinful to own a TV. And I never forget this one guy, he, he was telling me this story about being on visitation with this one guy and he knocked on this guy's door and they went in and he said, I told that guy, he better turn that television off. He's going to hell. He threw us out. Can you believe that? Yeah. I, I'd throw you out too if you told me that. So it's like, but the point is like, we got to build relationships with people. As we're building relationships, God opens doors for us to speak gospel truth into their life and, and share the hope that is within us. We've got to learn that God sees missions as a lifestyle and not as an event or a thing we do. Sharing the gospel is not something we do. It's a way of life. I don't just say, well, okay, guys, we're going to meet up here this Saturday and we're going to go out and we're going to share the gospel with people. No, we should be sharing the gospel with people in our everyday lives. When you're at the coffee shop and you strike up a conversation with that stranger, find a way to weave the gospel in. Find a way to, to, to say something, to, to let them know who you are and whose you are. And, and it could be something as simple as when you're at the restaurant today after church, the service is done. Uh, that after we finish worship gathering, you go to the restaurant today for lunch. It could be something as simple as when your waiter or waitress comes to the table to take your order or they deliver, bring your food, say, and say whatever their name is. Say it's, it's, it's John or it's Sue or whatever. You just say, you know what? Hey, I'm a Christian, and we're getting ready to pray over our food in just a moment. Is there something that we could pray for you, pray about for you today? Is there something we could pray for you about? You'd be surprised how many times people will tell you serious heavy stuff going on in their lives that they want someone to pray for them about, that they're facing. And you can have an opportunity to say, you know what, I'm a follower of Jesus and I would love to pray for you. Something as simple as that. But we've got to learn to view missions as a lifestyle, not a program. Missions happens in our everyday lives in our local communities. That's what we mean with gospel intentionality. That I believe when I'm sitting at the ground floor, probably in the morning, that that. I'm looking at it that I don't know who God's going to bring in my path and maybe God's going to open the door for me to have a conversation with somebody, that, that I'm prepared for that, that if I'm going to have lunch one day, that I'm open and I'm prepared that God's going to bring someone in my path that I can have a conversation with about Jesus in some way, shape, or form. And that's what it means. Everyday life is, our, is the mission as we live with gospel intentionality. Let me give you number four. The last thing, being the church means there will be fruit produced in our lives. Being the church means there will be fruit produced in our lives. First Corinthians chapter three, verse nine, Paul says, for we are both God's workers and you are God's field. You are God's building. That word field means cultivated land, which means God expects a harvest in our lives. He expects there to be fruit meaning there should be fruit in our lives showing that Jesus is at work in our hearts, that Jesus is at work changing who we are from the inside out. Now, it doesn't mean that, you know, we should, that we're going to be perfect. It doesn't mean that we should always like, that we're going to nail it every time, but it means that people see Jesus at work in our lives, that it's evident. Meaning, guess what? You and I should be looking more and more like Jesus every single day. That's sanctification. That, that's the process of being daily conformed into the image of Jesus. And guess what? As long as we're breathing, as long as we're living in this life, we're always going to be being sanctified. We're never going to be, we're never going to the place we've arrived. Okay, you're never going to have a day in this life where you say, man, I have reached it. I am now sanctified. Never going to happen. Every single day, we're going to be looking more and more like Jesus. We're supposed to be. And every single day, it is a work in progress. Because we are still sinful because of the flesh that we possess. We're still selfish people because of of the sin nature that we have. But yet there's that spirit we talked about that's in here that bears witness that when we do something and it's like, ooh, yeah, man, I shouldn't have done that. Man, man, I shouldn't have said that. Ooh, man, yeah, I got to go apologize to that person. Or, or maybe it's, oh, yeah, man, Lord, I, yeah, I'm slacking in that area. My relationship, yeah, Lord, it's, 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 it's not where it needs to be. But it means that we're looking more and more like Jesus every day. Mark Clifton, uh, in his book, Reclaiming Glory, he made this statement. 
He says, bearing fruit in the life of a church means having a pattern of making disciples who make disciples that results in communities being transformed. It means that bearing fruit in the life of a church means that we are seeing people conform to the image of Jesus and that they're doing the same thing and they're repeating the process. And it's a community of people every day whose lives are being transformed to look more and more like Jesus. So let's wrap this up as we close out. When we think about being the church, God intends for for us to live out our faith and for us to have a love for one another in community. He intends for us to live live out our faith and have a love for one another in community. And so being the church, it means that we follow Jesus. It means that we pursue Jesus. It means that we walk in his footsteps. We live out his word. And we trust in his power. Means that every single day when we wake up, the goal of my life when I get up in the morning is going to be to pursue Jesus. It's going to be to try to walk in his footsteps. I'm going to do my best by the power of the Holy Spirit at work in me to live out the word that's been proclaimed and to trust in that power every single day. David Platt again said, have you died to yourself? Have you taken up your cross? Are you following Jesus? Have you found your life in him? Are you eagerly proclaiming the good news of the kingdom as you await the return of the king? See, this is what it means to to be a follower of Jesus, and it's also what it means for us to be the church. We've died to ourselves. We've taken up our cross We're following Jesus because we have found new life in him. We are eagerly proclaiming the good news of the gospel, the good news of salvation, that Jesus has lived the life we were incapable of living, that Jesus died the death on the cross we deserve to die because of our sin, and Jesus took our punishment, and that Jesus rose from the grave on the third day victorious over death, hell, and the grave defeating death forever and giving us the hope of eternal life if we repent of our sin and we place our faith and trust in Jesus. That's the good news that we proclaim. And so the question for us today is this. Do we just see church as something we go to? Because let's be really honest. It's easy to get caught up in that because that's what our culture is. It's what our culture makes of church, that it's something we go to. It's an event we do. It's a place we go. And scripture says, no, that's not right. Church is not where you go. Church is not something you do. But church is who you are. It's who God's called us to be, to be the church, to make Jesus visible as we passionately follow him, to spread the good news of the gospel to be like Jesus and to step into people's messes, to step into people's hurts and their brokenness with the power of the good news of the gospel. So the question is today for us, number one, maybe we're here today and we've never taken that first step of obedience and and placed our faith and trust in Jesus. Then Jesus is calling to you today to repent of your sin, to turn from your sin, that's what that word means, to turn to Jesus by faith to trust in his finished work on the cross and to place your faith and trust in him for your eternal salvation and for forgiveness of your sins. If you've done that, wonderful. Then the question for you is, are you living as the church? Am I living as the church? Or are we treating church as something we go to and not who we are? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, I pray in these next few moments as we worship together again, and as God, we have this time to respond to your word today. God, I pray that we will respond in repentance and faith. If there be someone here today, God, that's in in the gathering of the church, that Lord, they have never come to a place of saving faith, and God, they're not in a relationship with Jesus. Lord, I pray that the Holy Spirit would work in their hearts in this moment, that he would draw them to you. And that, Father, you would reveal 
their need for a relationship with Jesus, a need to turn from their sin, to repent, to place their faith and trust in the finished work of Jesus on the cross as the sacrifice, the payment once and for all for their sin, and that they would trust in that finished work and receive eternal life. Father, for those that have placed their faith and trust in Jesus, I pray, God, that we, that we by repentance and faith, would turn to you today if we have been guilty of viewing church as where we go and what we do and we've not been viewing church as who we are, who you've called us to be. And it's how we're to live. So God, I pray you would work in our hearts. God, reveal to us how we can live out and be the church. Because God, I know every single one of us in this room, there are people that we know people that we have relational equity equity with, that God, we need to live out our faith in front of. We need to be the church too. We need to be the hands and feet of Jesus. So God, I pray that we would respond in repentance and faith and that you would move in our hearts today. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand together as we worship. And I pray that we respond in repentance and faith today. If you need to come and pray, We have this area that's been designated for prayer. You're invited to come and gather and pray. You're invited to pray and respond in your seat. If you need to speak with someone after the worship gathering is over today, we have people, myself, John, that would love to talk with you and pray with you. So today, may we respond in repentance and faith as we worship together.